moved to, yeah, I know. He moved to New York City in 1911. After reading W.E.B. Du Bois's The Souls of Black Folks, he decided to devote his life to fighting for African-American equality. In 1914, Brother Randolph married Lucille E. Green, a Howard University graduate and entrepreneur whose economic support allowed Randolph to pursue civil rights full time. She is an unsung hero. In 19, June 1925, a group of Pullman porters and all black service staff of the Pullman sleeping car company approached Brother Randolph and asked him to lead the new organization, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. Brother Randolph agreed and in 1925, he fully established the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. The Pullman Company was the largest single employer of African-Americans in the nation at the time. Many of the 10,000 Pullman porters were college graduates and highly respected in their own communities. Yet on the job, they were subjected to low wages, disrespectful treatment, in the discriminatory practices, Brother Randolph led them for 10 years, ultimately receiving recognition from the Pullman Car Company in 1935, as well as nearly uh, $2 million in increased wages, a shorter work week and overtime pay. So essentially the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Reporters became the nation's first officially recognized labor black labor union. He continued his struggles for economic e uh, equity during the 1930s by serving as the pre president of the National Negro Congress Brother Randolph became a widely known spokesman for African-American working class intellect, uh, interest in the country. In December of 1940, with President Roosevelt refusing to issue an executive order banning discrimination against black workers in the defense industry, Brother Randolph called for, uh, in, the, in the words of James Farmer, 10,000 loyal Negro American citizens to march on Washington, D.C. Support grew quickly that soon that he was calling for 100,000 marchers to converge on the Capitol. Pressed to, to take action, President Roosevelt issued an executive order on June 25th, 1941, six days before the march was to occur, declaring that there should be no discrimination in employment of workers in the defense industry or government because of race, creed, color, or national origin. After the passage of the Selective Service Act of 1947, Brother Randolph uh, demanded that the government integrate the armed forces. Uh, this after, after this morning, there was a fantastic panel celebrating the anniversary of the desegregation order. And one of the issues that came out is why don't we talk about what Truman gets a lot of press regarding his policies of, of, of ending segregation in armed services. But it, I think we, we tend to neglect just the impact that Randolph's call and demands for this back when he was making uh, claims for the uh, 1941 March on Washington, that's one of, one of the things he advocated for was uh, allowing Black men to serve in the integrated service. He founded the League for Nonviolent Civil Disobedience Against Military Segregation and urged young men, both Black and white, to refuse to cooperate with a Jim Crow, Jim Crow conscription service, threatening widespread civil disobedience and needing the Black vote in his 1948 reelection campaign. President Truman signed an executive order in January 26, 1948, ending uh, discrimination, quote, as quickly as possible. Brother Randolph is credited with being an architect of the 1963 March on Washington as well. This march offered Martin Luther King Jr. a forum for his famous I Have a Dream speech and is credited with creating the momentum that led to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Brother Randolph continued to advocate for political and economic equality throughout his life. He was one of the founders of the National American, uh, excuse me, the Negro American Labor Council and served as president from 1960 to 1966. In 1964, he was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by President Lyndon Johnson. 1968, he was named the president of the recently formed A. Philip Randolph Institute, which was established by the AFL CIO to promote trade unionism in black, the black community. He would continue to serve on the AFL CIO executive board until 1974 which was extremely controversial because during the 19, mid-1930s, so many uh, Black-led unions that were affiliated with the American Federation of Labor uh, left to join the burgeoning uh, upstart uh, organization called the Congress of Industrial Organization, which provided greater protections and access to union rights and benefits than the Stallworth AFL. Um, and Randolph would constantly receive criticism by Black unionists. And one of the things that he truly believed was that in order to fight discrimination within the House of Labor, he needed to stay there and, and continue to impress on that fight. 
And I think uh, as I look around, uh, Cornelius Bynum, my, my, my good friend and brother and colleague over there at Purdue, he does a, he's one of the, the experts on, on Randolph in the nation. I think you know, his, his work uh, really frames this much better than I could in just such a, a, a brief period of time. Um, brother Randolph continued to advocate for political and economic equalities throughout his life. I meant set apart. Randolph was a member of Iota Sigma chapter Phi Beta Sigma and uh, crossed in Richmond, Virginia, somewhere in the 1930s. I believe I saw a document that said around 1933, but uh, maybe some of the brothers up here can en enlighten me on that one. Um, he was a socialist, ran for president as a socialist, uh, socialist candidate, um, organized union elevator workers in 1917 uh, in New York City, and became president of the National Brotherhood of Workers in 1919. He was just, his career spans uh, so many important events in black labor history. But I think what I wanna talk about very briefly is uh, my work largely revolves, revolves around black Chicago. I've been studying the period. I'm, I'm a, I was born and raised in Chicago and the neighbor, um, my family uh, came to Chicago in 1905 in the years traditionally outside of the traditional great migration to the city. So um, I tell the story when my, my, my grandparents talk about down home we don't have conversations about Mississippi or Louisiana or Arkansas or, 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 or Memphis. We talk about Chicago and largely we talk about Bronzeville. We talk about 39th Street. We talk about, some people call it the low end, but the traditional black community of Chicago. And one of the things that happens there is when, uh, when Randolph was organizing the brotherhood, there are a number of stories about he would travel oftentimes on a shoestring budget between Chicago, New York, and other places to, just to talk to the porters. And there was one individual who was, in, who was very in, important in the story. And this is a, another porter who was not a Sigma, but his name was Milton Webster. And Milton Webster was a domineering figure in the Brotherhood. And the story goes that A. Philip Randolph traveled to Chicago. And if he was able to win the support of Milton Webster, then he would win the larger support of the, the rank and file within the Brotherhood of Park Borders. And I think it's important to note that Chicago as a hub in which Randolph was operating in, Chicago was the headquarters of the Pullman Company. Pullman having come to Chicago in the, uh, the, the 1870s to help rebuild the city after the Chicago fire. Had, you know, and the story is quite famous. He came there as a young hydraulics engineer, took the train from uh, out east to Chicago and started to draw plans on the Pullman Palace cars, these opulent train cars. And one of the things that he wanted to do, he wanted white people to feel like they were riding in the most luxurious uh, transportation uh, mode in the country. So he, he decked these train cars out and he rented them to the, the, the railroad company. But one of the things that uh, Pullman did, which is both nefarious but also I think extremely important for the larger trajectory of black labor history and developing the black middle class is that he hired um, ex bonds people, ex enslaved people, right? To work as porters, butlers on these trains to make white people feel that they had this, this consistent serving class uh, working at their, and available at their beck and call. Now on the surface, I think that some people would judge uh, this effort by Pullman as, as being overtly racist, you may have a point. However, if we think about black workers agency, right? Uh, these black men were afforded opportunities not uh, av openly available for, for African-Americans at this time. These, these individuals were able to travel the country. They weren't regulated to working in the steel mills or the docks. Or the lumber, or the lumber uh, uh, fields, or in the coal, the coal fields, uh, or in agriculture, they were able to wear uniforms. They were able to work for tips. Mind you, they were working, you know, 60, 70, 80 hours, overworked, underpaid. But in their community, they were something special, right? Being a porter opened the doors for into the into the middle class. I think it's sort of akin to what people saw the post office in the 1930s and 40s. This was something that afforded African-Americans salaries and opportunities heretofore not known to them. So when, when Randolph is organizing the porters and when he goes there to get the support of 
um, uh, people like Webster, he goes and he, and I was talking to my brother Omar over there the other day, is I live in Bronzeville now. I lived in Bronzeville about 22 and a half years and I do tours of Black Chicago. And this is one church, the Metropolitan Baptist Church, which was a, a location. They, they were constantly a host a Philip Randolph when he came to Chicago and did his organizing and the church is up for sale now. And I think that the, my chapter, uh, our fraternity house, we, we have the only fraternity house and the oldest fraternity house in the Great Lakes region, the great, great Lakes region. And um, our, our, our chapter was home to um, a number of dignitaries such as uh, Harold Washington, the first black mayor of Chicago, the most segregated city probably in the world uh, was a member of my chapter. Uh, he was made as, as mayor. Uh, Milton, uh, excuse me, uh, Arthur Works Mitchell, the country's first black Democratic <laughs> congressman, was a member of my, was actually president of my chapter. Uh, we have the one of the, the the first black Illinois Supreme Court justices is a member of my chapter, along with a number of uh, Congress people, state legislature, who are all members of of my chapter. So it's it's, it's, a, it's a very important chapter, and I think what's important was that Brother Randolph is organizing in this in this black community down the street from the fraternity house, right? So there's these conversations that are going on with the brothers, uh, in, uh, the Sigma brothers there, but also informing his work uh, in, in Chicago. Uh, but the church is for sale now. So I think that there's a, the, there are these opportunities for us to, and I don't wanna go over to Omar's conversation about, about how, we, how we frame these, these sites, but I think there's a, there are these opportunities for us to, especially in Chicago, to talk about Randolph and really what he meant. And as in Chicago's important role played in the, the, the black freedom struggle of the 20th century. Um, and interestingly enough, I think this church also is important in the story of Chicago civil rights and Randolph because when he declared, so there's a thing about the March on Washington movement, right? So the, the story goes that A. Philip Randolph, Walter White, who was head of the NAACP, they get this meeting with Franklin Roosevelt. And um, Randolph makes this threat, which Randolph, excuse me, which, which Roosevelt wasn't quite sure he was willing to go through with. But I think uh, what James Farmer talks about, and he says this in Eyes and the Prize, that it was a strategic bluff on, on Randolph's part. And I'm not too sure about that. Um, but when Roosevelt capitulated and signed the executive order, any discrimination in the workplace, but not desegregating the armed services, I think that on the one hand, we can see that as a, as a victory for black workers, but uh, some of Randolph's contemporaries uh, took issue with the fact that we didn't get a desegregated armed services. And I think that really informs uh, Randolph's work after the war is over and his push to continue to get black men on equal, black men and women on equal footing um, of their white contemporaries in armed services. But um, after F the FEPC was established and Executive Order 8802 was signed, he called the march off. But what was interesting in, about Randolph's rhetoric and his activism in Chicago is that while nationally the March on Washington branches held off on sending people to Washington, D.C., the folks in Chicago continued to organize. And they sent about 200 people to Washington and did, and did a Chicago March on Washington, right? So I think what that, what that tells us is that in, in the larger, I think, trajectory of, of Black activism, well, I make the case that that Chicago activism was a little bit different because it was it was a very just independent nature of civil rights activism in the city, and this was occurred for a variety of reasons: politics, the culture of the city, so forth. The, the, the its center as a as an industrial hub, a, a center of uh, CIO activism, uh, black radical activism that took place in the city. But I think that Randolph really galvanized that spirit of workers and activists in Chicago and it, and it encouraged them to go out and, and do such things. And um, so I think that's an important part of his rhetoric. And I think that kind of, I think this is kind of the, 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 the string that pulls all of these, our talks together. Because I know Brother Johnson is gonna talk a lot about uh, rhetorical strategies that go in there. And I don't wanna belabor this point because I wanted my brothers to talk too, but I think I just wanna put that out there that, that um, A. Philip Randolph, 
A. Philip Randolph is this catalyst for the Black freedom struggle that, struggle that we don't talk enough about. And I think maybe we can come back in the question and answer part um, and part of the conversation and, and talk more about where he fits and really what he means for uh, our struggle and, and Black resistance. <laughs> I wrote all of this stuff, didn't read any of it. Like, I don't know why. Yes, so when Brother Kimball reached out to me to do this panel, I'm not a labor historian. Um, I write primarily on, on popular culture and, and Black masculinity. But I will say, can, can you hear me now? Okay, I, I write primarily on popular culture and, and Black masculinity. Um, but I will say that when... I was offered the opportunity to join the dorm alumni chapter of Phi Beta Sigma. Um, one of the things that drew me to the organization uh, were the litany of men who had gone through the, the, the organization before I did. Uh, Elaine Locke, yeah. of course, um, James Weldon Johnson, uh, we all had to learn <laughs> again, <laughs> lift every voice and sing. Um, Huey P. Newton, um, and of course, A. Philip Randolph. And, and I, I felt a particular charge as a black professor to, to double down on this particular tradition of the fraternity, because many of the younger members go through the fraternity and don't actually have a relationship with those figures. Mm -hmm. um, so this offered me an, an opportunity to think at large uh, about A. Philip Randolph. And I decided to do so through the guise of a 1964 film, um, Michael Romer's Nothing But a Man. Uh, one of the most important images of Black masculinity in the 20th century came courtesy of Michael Romer's film, Nothing But a Man, set in Alabama, but filmed on location primarily in Atlantic City, New Jersey throughout 1963. The film was completed a month after the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Nothing but a man with its focus on black masculinity and fatherhood in relationship to work and organized labor serves in part as a tribute to Asa Philip Randolph, co-founder of The Messenger, and who was most well known as the organizer of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. During freedom rides and civil rights marches of the early 1960s in which media coverage often depicted black men as loose cannons with little respect for the law, however unjust, nothing but a man offered a rarely seen and perhaps unprecedented portrait of black men. As such, the director Michael Romer used NAACP full workers to help do research for the film, adding a level of authenticity to the narrative. At the center of the film was Duff Anderson, portrayed with brooding nuance by Ivan Dixon, whose gestures, facial and physical, conveyed the complexity of black manhood that had rarely, usually not been presented in television and film, where it was usually presented as cartoonish and threatening. Duff Anderson was neither Stephen Fetchett, the bumbling and shuffling character that actor Lincoln Perry made a crossover star in the 1930s, or Malcolm X, an icon of, Mal of black militancy for generations. Duff Anderson was, as the film suggests, just a man. Working with an all black unionized section gang, so-called Gandhi dancers, who help maintain railroad tracks throughout the South, Duff meets and fall in love, falls in love with the preacher's daughter, Josie, who is betrayed by noted jazz vocalist, Abby Lincoln. Yet Duff carries many of the demons that burn in black men throughout the early 20th century. He left a four-year-old son in Birmingham with a woman that he didn't marry. Is estranged. He's estranged from his own father. And though working the railroad afforded him freedom and money in comparison to most working class black men, the work isolated him from community and family. At every turn as Duff considers marrying Josie, raising his estranged son and starting a family with her, it is the question of work-life balance, far different from most whites, in which life is not just a metaphor for the quality of life, but for life itself. Duff, for example, after marrying Josie and having to leave his unionized railroad job, takes a job at a local sawmill. 
when Duff suddenly tries to organize the black men at the mill to quote unquote stand up for themselves, he is summarily fired and subsequently blacklisted from jobs at other mills. Now, if you want to work like a real nigger, a local bartender tells Duff, you can always go out and chop, chop cotton. Faced with the only job opportunities that he saw as both demanding and backward, as he says, they've done this too long in my family, Duff chooses flight. Duff Anderson is an echo of the men that A. Philip Randolph first organized as elevator operators and later as sleeping car porters, where trade unions offered black men some modicum of financial security, a level of social respect among Negroes, and a finer sense of their masculinity. In an era when mass manhood was largely tethered to your ability to have stable employment. Yet in the bartender's question, one can hear Eugene Debs's appeal to Negro workers, cautioning black workers to not be, quote, willing to be menials and servants and slaves to the white people. It was an appeal that Randolph took seriously in the formation of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, the use of the term brotherhood, perhaps an, a nod to the African blood brotherhood of Cyril Briggs, which was also influential on the ideas of the young A. Philip Randolph after he moved to Harlem in 1911. Indeed, brotherhood, scholarship, service, the mantra of the brothers of Phi Beta Sigma would remain a guiding principle of A. Philip Randolph for the rest of his life and career. Randolph's migration from Jacksonville, Florida to the emerging black Mecca of Harlem would be the stimulus for what historian Cornelius Bynum describes as a process of reinvention for Randolph, notably in his transition from being simply known as Asa to becoming a Philip, which carried an aura of a cosmopolitanism that would be in the spirit of the new Negro movement. Randolph's Harlem homecoming was not unlike that of many Negroes who were being reinvented to all that paid attention as new Negroes. That so many came home to Harlem or Chicago under the guise of opportunity serves as a useful metaphor for a reimagining of blackness, manhood, and politics. These were processes of transformation that were befitting the so-called jazz age, where the spirit of modernist creativity, social and artistic improvisation, and the collaborative ethos of the big bands of James Reese Europe, Fletcher Henderson, and Duke Ellington in the context in which many would claim this as their entry point into a world made anew. Among them would be Randolph, who finds his initial footing in Ye Friends of Shakespeare, the Harlem Shakespeare Society, where his sense of performativity, which would later have an outlet in his oratory, would align with his sense of an emerging radicalism, social consciousness, and talent for organizing. In Shakespearean drama, Randolph found one of his defining mantras, Above all, to thine own self be true, then thou canst be false to no man. Culture for service, service for humanity. The brothers of Phi Beta Sigma are often reminded, and it was a phrase that Randolph began to embody even in the earliest years of fraternity. Randolph finds his political voice in The Messenger, the journal that he would launch with fellow socialist traveler Chandler Owens. The pages of the Messenger were a site of spirited debate with other journals like Cyril Briggs's Crusader, Hubert Harrison's Negro Voice, and most notably Marcus Garvey's Negro World. That such debates often spilled out to the street corners where activists stood on boxes speaks to the palpable spirit of discourse that was in that moment an analog or pre-digital example of what Black Twitter once was. That Randolph and Owens also utilizing community book clubs and study groups as part of a broader effort of what Jarvis R. Givens details in his important book, Fugitive Pedagogy, highlights their commitment to Black study. The New Negro marked a period in which Black men came to public voice, though Randolph and the pages of The Messenger offer a more complex view of gender in that moment. Indeed, one of the messenger's major patrons was Lucille Campbell Green Randolph, a local Harlem businesswoman and wife of A. Philip Randolph. Quote, the new Negro woman with her head erect and spirit undaunted, ever conscious of his historic and noble mission of doing her bit toward the liberation of her people in particular and the human race in general, is how the messenger described black women in a 1923 issue devoted to the new Negro woman. Though Lucille Campbell Randolph was not a member of Zeta Phi Beta Incorporated, 
her marriage and partnership with her husband mirror the relationship between the sorority and Phi Beta Sigma, which are constitutionally bound. The only, come yes. on, come, come on now. <laughs> We heard Indeed, it. when one glances at the rather dour demeanor of Randolph and the many photos taken of him during the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, one sees the impression of an elder who is being pushed to the margins of a movement that he helped create, as much as we see a man who lost his life partner only months earlier in April of 1963. Mm -hmm. It was on the pages of the messenger that Randolph called into question the idea of the slacker porter contrasting him with the manly man. As Robert Hawkins writes, through this binary opposition, Randolph constructed an ideal of black working class manhood founded in dignified work race pride and labor solidarity. Like many of his peers, Randolph was not immune to the so-called respectability politics of the era as he sought to rehabilitate the idea of the black worker through trade unionism. And indeed, there were some of some, and these were some of the most pronounced, pronounced themes of nothing but a man, which also links these attributes to an idealized black fatherhood. Nothing but a man was also notable for its soundtrack, which featured music exclusively from the Motown Recording Company, which at the time was an up and coming black owned corporation that had only been incorporated three years before the film was shot. It was both prescient on Romer's part and savvy of label owner Barry Gordy to include the quote unquote sound of young America as part of the film's soundscape. Indeed, Gordy's bet on black popular music that would cross over to white mainstream audiences would dramatically shift the prospect of many black musicians well into the future. None of this would have been conceivable to Randolph who in erecting language of manhood for black working class union members pitted these workers against the quote, tip taking working class musician. Ironically, given Randolph's own proximity to the black performance and the black creative classes, his stance seemed surprising. But what Randolph was just opposing was the image of a hardworking black man to that of the itinerant blues man sitting at a train station performing for his meals. As Miriam Thackard argues in her book, Writing Jane Crow, the train flat platform was a site for which the right of black people to sell their wares, whether fried chicken sandwiches or blues tunes were contested. When Randolph to use Hawkins words, quote, asked quarters to decide whether they were proudly laboring union men, a musical medicants performing on the street for whatever the Pullman company and the traveling public might throw their way, he was contributing to this discourse. Nearly a century after Randolph offered these words in a historical moment when labor unions continue to be under assault, especially those that are visibly black, one wonders how Randolph would view the situation of the run of the mill black musician or rapper or Hollywood writer who sell their wares to transnational corporations but are offered little beyond the status of a contract laborer. Thank you. <laughs> Well, good afternoon again, everybody. My name is, again, Omar Eaton Martinez. Uh, I, I dabble in museums <laughs> and public uh, historic sites yes. and memorialization and trying to intersect all those things with justice and community engagement. And so what I've been tasked to do is to, it's not an exhaustive list, but to give you a little bit of a taste of how we have been able to capture the legacy of our good brother, A. Philip Randolph. And I can't tell you, how overjoyed I am to be on the stage with my frat. This is incredible. So I'm so Go mob. mad. Go mob. I'm here right now. No, no, no. no. <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about like really the importance of statues. <clears throat> you know, we've heard all these things with the Confederate statue mm -hmm. and whatnot, but when it comes to memorializing the black experience, you know, we have a different lens. And um, it's really important that we understand that it's our duty, not only to the descendants of those who have endured this intense and immense suffering that contributed significantly to the fabric of our society, but also to ourselves as we strive for a more inclusive and just future. We look to these statues and to these art, to these um, art pieces, whether they're performance or their paintings or what have you, in, in a way to be encouraged and to be reinvigorated to continue the fight, the fight 
uh, the justice that we have, we fight for justice for that we justly deserve. So, you know, we know that these statues and monuments have always played a significant role in preserving and celebrating our history, culture, and values. They serve as potent symbols of our shared heritage, as well as a reminder of the lessons we've learned from our past. Yet for a long time, you know, Black people and their remarkable contributions to American history have been neglected in that regard. But, my, but by memorializing African descendants with statues and other forms of memorials, we are acknowledging the undeniable contributions they have made during our, for our nations. Our ancestors were captured and endured the treacherous journey of the Middle Passage to the courageous leaders of the civil rights movement, to the movement leaders and culture keepers of today. Black people have played an integral role in shaping the America we know today and the world. Uh, their stories are a testament to the resilience of the human spirit in the face of adversity, and they inspire us all to strive for a more equitable and just society. Moreover, statues and monuments serve as educational tools, especially when they're done in proper context. They provide a platform for learning and discussion, allowing us to engage with our history, warts and all, right? So you have these, these statues, these monuments, these paintings, these performances, literary uh, pieces, they give us a Socratic moment to really engage with our history and our culture. And so you know, the lack of, uh, uh, the act of memorialization sends a powerful message to future generations. It says that we are committed to a more inclusive, diverse and equitable society that encourages young minds to aspire to greatness, regardless of their background and reinforces the idea that any more, regardless of their race or ethnicity can make a lasting impact on our nation. And so, you know, we can't overstate the importance of doing this work, especially when it comes to Asa Philip Randolph and my, my, my two brothers have already laid out the history for you here. He is, has an incredible legacy, but we all know it's understated when it comes to the, the pantheon of, of, of iconic civil rights leaders. And we are hopefully here to, to course correct that so that we can really have the proper context of the full legacy of activism during that time. Now, as we erect these monuments and celebrate the achievements of African-Americans, we take a crucial step toward a more unified and enlightened society. So we should embrace this opportunity and ensure that our history reflects the full spectrum of our shared American experience. If you look at this first slide, that picture of Brother Randolph was done by the one and only Gordon Parks, mm. right? So, so we have, we have so th there's an intersection here. We get to lift up the legacy of the man in the pictures and in the statues and other forms of memorialization, but also the people who memorialize them, we need to honor them as well, because we know the great legacy of Gordon Parks. Mm -hmm. um, next slide. And that was done in 1942. So here we have um, the statue or the monument, really, um, in the Union Station in Washington, D.C. Has anybody ever seen this? It's a beautiful Ooh, yeah. statue. I have not. Um, I would argue it's not in the best position in the station. It could be better. You know, the politics of space is real. Right. And uh, we, have to, we have to remember that. But this was done uh, by an African-American sculptor, Ed Dwight. And it was commissioned. member of Phi Beta Sigma. Right. <laughs> did not know that. <laughs> I did not know that. That's awesome. Um, so he, he did this um, under the commission of the AFL-CIO. Uh, which is important to note, and um, obviously is honoring his great legacy as the Black labor and civil rights leader and the founder of the Brotherhood of Sleeping, uh, Sleeping Car Porters. Um, but also what it says at the bottom, which you may not be able to see, it says, at the, this is a quote from, from Brother Randolph, it says, at the banquet, banquet table of nature, there are no reserved seats. You get what you can take and you keep what you can hold. If you can't take anything, you won't get anything. And if you can't hold anything, you won't keep anything. And you can't take anything without organization, right? So when I think about his legacy, I think about his connection to our fraternity. I think about the reasons why I chose Sigma. It, these are the reasons, right? Hmm. Organization, culture for service, service for humanity, understanding our tenets of brotherhood scholarship, in, in, uh, in service. All these things are really important to us. And just a little bit about Ed White, now that I especially not know he's fat. 
Uh, <laughs> he was a graduate engineer and he was the first African-American astronaut candidate, right? So that's wow. not, nothing to be understated. Um, he's dedicated his career to, uh, to doing these, uh, these types of pieces. Um, he has um, a series of bronzes depicting the contributions of Blacks to the American frontier West. And uh, he also has uh, about a series of 50 bronzes that, were, um, that was exhibited over there in the Jefferson National Expansion Memorial Park. So he's done a lot of work for the National Park Service. But in that work, he was actually encouraged to bring another bronze series celebrating the roots of jazz. And so he has a great piece with Miles Davis. If you look it up, it's a beautiful bronze sculpture he did um, it, for that series called Jazz in American Art Form. And now he has over 70 bronzes characterizing the creation, creation and evolution of jazz from his African and European roots to the fusion of contemporary music. Um, he's done, again, with the National Park Service. If anybody, ever been to the Frederick Douglass uh, site uh, that he did that he did that um, statue of Frederick Douglass as well. So he's created over 18,000 gallery sculptures and is represented in, in many galleries throughout the country. Uh, he even was commissioned in 2009 to do uh, bronze bronze work uh, Michelle and Barack Obama that I believe are still on tour to this day. Um, so he he has done incredible work and so it's just good to understand the connections of the people who create the memorialization as well as the people that we are memorializing. Uh, next slide. So this is um, another bronze done by an African-American woman sculptor, Tina Allen. So those who follow uh, sculpture should know both these names very well. Tina Allen, uh, unfortunately, left, left us too soon. She died back in 2008 at the young age of 58. Uh, but this work was her first major work that's over there in Boston and Back Bay. Anybody from Boston or been over there? If you haven't, please go over there and check it out. It's a, it's a, it's a beautiful piece. Um, and this uh, obviously was done in connection to his work and his legacy with the, with the Sleeping Car Porters. Uh, Tina Allen herself uh, was, was known for doing these bronze pieces of African-American uh, folks and, and notable people. Um, her father was a jazz drummer and she's Grenada born. She, so she has a West Indian lens to her work as well. Um, she describes her art as history in bronze because she always focused on important black historical figures and wanted to portray them through sculpture. Uh, Alan often focused on the Harlem Renaissance, and she also had periods of her work focused specifically on Black men, and then she turned her interest to Black women. Uh, she, um, she has done a lot of different things, including uh, a great piece, and I, I meant to put it on the slide, but it's a beautiful statue of George Washington Carver, another notable member of Phi Beta Sigma, right. uh, that is uh, in the George Washington Carver gar Garden at the Missouri Botanical Gardens in St. Louis. So it's a 12 foot piece. She's done a 12, well, actually, actually that's a more of a life size piece. She did a 12 foot piece also of Sojourner Truth, uh, honoring the suffragist movement um, over there in Memorial Park, Battle Creek in Michigan. Uh, so she's done a, a, a tremendous amount of work. And um, as you can see on the bottom, maybe you can see it on the bottom image, she actually signs her name on his shoe. Um, and she's, again, one of the sculptors we try to honor more and more. I, I do work um, with one of our sites in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. It's a site of Daniel Chester French. Uh, so it's a historic artist home and studio where, where he did his work. And Daniel Chester French is the designer of the Lincoln Memorial. Um, and so what we try to do there is we try to be inclusive um, and expansive in telling the American, the full American story. And we want to work more in bringing these legacies of Black sculptors and other sculptors who are on the margins, like, um, like Tina Allen and Ed Dwight. Uh, next slide. So this is the uh, National Asa Philip Randolph Home Porter Museum in Chicago. How many people even know this existed? That's good. That's more than that. I mean, it is an understated place, but it's a powerful place. And I really hope you all go, go get, go, go to, to see and visit it. Uh, Dr. Lynn Hughes uh, was the founder and is also led by 
uh, her protege, David Peterson, who was founded back in 1995 in, in, uh, in South Side of Chicago. Um, it, it, it holds a, talks about the legacy of Randolph and the Porters. And uh, right now it is currently focused on black labor history, being the only black labor history museum in the nation. It's preparing for a $30 million expansion right now for those fundraisers out there. Um, but they also are looking to create a black labor district in the South Side of Chicago, honoring Asa Philip Randolph's memory, uh, memory and legacy. So as you can see up there um, in the big picture on the bottom, I'm there with Dr. Hughes over my right shoulder and David Peterson over my left. On the top, you can see the images from the grounds, uh, which feature art pieces that honor the legacy of Brother Randolph. Um, there's also um, paintings inside of the museum. And then you see the actual images of the building uh, over there in the South Side. And they do have uh, a working relationship with the historic Pullman District that's been designated as a national monument under the National Park Service. And it has now recently, December 29th of 2022, um, the legislation signed by the uh, President Biden included a provision that changed the designation of Pullman National Monument to now Pullman National Historical Park. So the historic Pullman community was designated as a national monument by President Obama in 2015. And so this is a big deal that we're honoring this uh, site in this way. And I hope we can continue to, uh, to, to honor uh, Brother Randolph um, and that museum, they really focused on taking sort of his socialist strand and making sure that they're there for the community. The expand the expansion is really community focused, and they've been they they've been freedom fighters in that neighborhood for a long time. I know they've worked with local chapters, graduate chapters of Sigma. I know Brother Dr. Kimball has has been involved with them and have been in um, talks with them as well. Next slide. That's the Pullman Porter site uh, that's under the National Park Service. Next slide. So these are commissioned portraits that exist um, at the National Portrait Gallery. Um, these are important pieces uh, that have been done. Uh, the one on the left is done by Ernest Hamlin Baker. Uh, it, was, it is a white artist. Um, it was done in 1945. Um, in 1978, or, or between 1945 and 1978, Time Magazine acquired that portrait. And then Time Magazine in 1978 um, gave about 800 works of original cover art to the National Portrait Gallery, which included this piece. And the museum is definitely dedicated to the stories of individuals who shaped uh, the country. And the Time Collection features prominent international figures and events, uh, which all, always enrich our understanding of the United States in its global context. Um, and then if you look at the other picture on the left, that was given by the Harmon Foundation, a philanthropic organization based in New York. Um, this was part of an exhibition called The Portraits of Outstanding Americans of Negro Origin, which opened at the Smithsonian in 1944. So this is right at, at his height, after 1941 and, and, the, and the notoriety that he received through his activism. And this particular exhibition documented uh, noteworthy African-Americans uh, contributions to the United States, modeling their goal of social equality. Uh, the Harmon, um, Harmon sought Portraits from African American artist Laura Wheeler Waring and Euro American artist Betsy Graves Raynaud. And the two painters followed the conventional codes of academic portrait, portraiture, seeking to convey their sitters' extraordinary accomplishments. And this painting, along with a variety of educational materials, toured nationwide for 10 years, serving as a visual rebuttal to racism. And so this is the power. Of, of these visual representations that honor the legacy that, that people throw up. And this is actually done in the spirit of justice and honoring and lifting up black folks. Unfortunately, we have people who've done the same thing to do the exact opposite. And that's why we have all of this uh, controversies 
although it's not very controversial for me in terms of the Civil, Civil War monuments that had to come down. Because people did that to also evoke a certain narrative that was based on a false narrative, a lost cause narrative um, that really evoked white supremacy in the absolute worst way. And I think that ends my presentation. Thank you. Blue five. All right. And again, good afternoon. I am uh, Andre Johnson. Uh, I want to, before uh, I, I do my presentation, just shout out any other members of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated. If you're in the house, hey, all right, there you go, Blue Fire, all right. And we cannot forget the uh, finer women of our constitutionally bound sisters of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. Come on in this house. So glad to have all of you here. Um, and we will definitely have some time for some Q&A. Um, so I will just go ahead on and just present um, because I do, I think we, we will have some time to discuss a little bit further. I wanna talk about, I have compassion upon the multitude, the prophetic rhetoric of A. Philip Randolph and the meaning of Jesus. That's the title of that I'm working. Thank you. Brother Kimball for giving me another writing assignment that I'm gonna have to you know, work on and hopefully get uh, published cause I really got into this and I won't be able to of course present the entirety um, uh, on today, but I do wanna- Put the preacher last. I, I, I wanna just get a little snapshots. That's, that's all, a little snapshot. I know where I am. I'm just gonna govern myself accordingly. All right. In the October 1919 issue of The Messenger, the magazine that A. Philip Randolph and Chandler Owen founded two years earlier, Randolph penned an editorial titled, The Failure of the Negro Church. He began with, yes, the Negro Church has failed. It has failed in a great crisis. Its failure is patent and apparent. For Randolph, the reason for the church failure was economic. The church for him had been converted into a business, 1919. Only concerned with profits, thereby focus upon debits and credits, deficits and surpluses. This business model of church had also affected black churches as well, especially those of the Episcopal, Congregational, Presbyterian and Methodist Episcopal traditions. He argued that these churches policies were quote, molded by and handed down from the white ecclesiastical oligarchy. Mm -hmm. This ecclesiastical oligarchy in turn is controlled by the quote, money power of the country. For Randolph, the black church has also failed because it has not educated the people. Ministers are leading Negroes, Randolph argued, who are below in intelligence to the lowest member of their church. He continued, the Negro ministry is ignorant of the modern problems of capital and labor. It is disinterested in unionism as a means for securing wages, shorter hours, higher wages, shorter hours and better working condition for Negro workers. It regards the discussion of politics in the church as sacrilegious unless some good old Abraham Lincoln Republican desires the vote of the Negro and is willing to pay for educational propaganda. It has failed to use its power to rouse the Negro against disenfranchisement and lynching. Randolph called for the two things, two things rather, to address the problem with the black church in 1919. First, he called for, I got some music going on. Is that, I, I was waiting on the organ. Where's the hammer? <laughs> Put me in C sharp. I'm, <laughs> Randolph was called. No. See y'all, y'all, see y'all ain't no good. Y'all are no bad, I ain't, man, I ain't coming back here. <laughs> Randolph called for two things to address the problem with the black church. First, he called for an educated ministry. 
He argued that the black church must get the education of information instead of the education of inspiration. It needs less Bible and more economics, history, sociology, and physical science. Second, Randolph argued that the church must be put to different uses. For him, the church, quote, must become an open educational forum where problems of hygiene, labor, government, racial relationships, national and international questions are discussed by specialists. Churches might also be used as places for the beginning of cooperative stores that would enable the Negro workmen to reduce the high cost of living. And he closed the editorial by stating this, quote, the new Negro demands a new ministry, an educated, fearless, and radical ministry. The new Negro demands a new church, a church that is the center of his social, economic, and political hopes and strivings. The church must become something more than a temple of prayer to the people who are lynched, disenfranchised, and Jim Crowed. Prayer, must be, prayer has been tried for over 50 years. In short, the church must set its face against a philosophy of profits to a philosophy of service. Wow, okay. According to historian Cynthia Tello, the editorial is often cited as evidence of Randolph's anti-church and uh, 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 agnostic, at least, or even atheist position. For instance, author Edwin Embray, I think it was around 1944, suggested that Randolph was a doubter of Christianity and one who stood against all religion. He maintained that Randolph only used religion and religious imagery in his rhetoric only as a way to influence his followers in his labeled and civil rights activism. Embry wrote, wrote, quote, while uncompromising in his public stand and honest almost to a point of fanaticism, Randolph was not above appealing to the porters in their own terms. Though he was an atheist, he knew that many of the Negro workers came from deeply religious homes. So in his speeches and in the Brotherhood paper, The Black Worker, he fell back on the biblical language and imagery he had learned from his father. He spread at the top of his bulletins, the Bible text, ye shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. He pointed out that the church should support labor, quote, since Jesus Christ was a carpenter. He called, he was called, quote, a Moses leading the people from the land of bondage into the promised land. Now, while many have followed this line of thinking and doing uh, research on A. Philip Randolph, in her biography of him, Cynthia Taylor challenges this perception of the labor leader. She argues that Randolph's, quote, religiosity covered a wild spectrum of liberal Protestant beliefs from religious humanism on the left to orthodox theological positions on the right. She positions Randolph not as a deeply religious man, but as one with more nuance, a more nuanced view of his connections to theology. Now, according to Teller, Randolph said nothing affecting him as deeply as his relationship with the AME church. He and his brother grew up under it, grew up in it, and our father was a part of it, and our mother was quite religious. What he learned from his parents and the church he attended was, quote, a sense of dignity and pride in oneself and one's race, the necessity of fighting and demanding uh, civil rights as being integral to possessing human dignity, not just independently, but also collectively and as a community, and love and admiration for learning, for the learning of edu uh, and education. It was these values that provided the foundation for Randolph's lifelong commitment to fighting racial justice, racial, I mean, fighting racial prejudice, and condition him for a life of service to others. So the question I wrestled with when I um, was given this assignment, how does one, uh, how does a misunderstanding of Randolph's religiosity happen? Um, in the Q&A, I mean, somebody might want to ask me about his relationship 
with Bishop Henry McNeil Turner, he and his father and the relationship with Bishop Turner. Very interesting story. Don't have time to go into it right now. But why the, the, why, how did this happen? Well, there may be several answers, but I will surmise that much of the confusion is rooted in a misunderstanding of Black religious expression broadly and the African-American prophetic tradition in particular. I define prophetic rhetoric as discourse grounded in the sacred, rooted in a community experience that offers a critique of existing communities and traditions by charging and challenging society to live up to ideals they espouse while offering celebration, encouragement, and hope for a brighter future. It is a rhetoric categorized by a steadfast refusal to adopt itself to the perspectives of its audience and a rhetoric that dedicates itself to the rights of individuals. Located in the margins of the society, it intends to lift the people to an ethical conception of whatever the people deem as sacred by adopting at times a controversial style of speaking. Woe unto you. Moreover, the rights of the individuals that prophetic rhetoric dedicates itself to is especially that of the poor, marginalized, and exploited members of society. It intends to lift the people to an ethical conception of the deity. Now, this definition also explicates a four-part rhetorical structure. Real quick, first, the text must ground itself or the speech or whatever, it grounds itself in the sacred. There's an element second of conscious raising through a sharing or an announcement of what's really happening, naming the demon, as I call it if I was in class. Third is the charge, the challenge, the critique, the judgment, or the warning. And then, of course, the last is the encouragement and hope. Now, traditionally, many people studying prophetic rhetoric focus on two primary traditions. The first one is apocalyptic prophecy. If you don't know what it is, this is what it is. It is, oh, God is coming back or somebody's gonna come and get you if you don't act right and move and nothing is you can do about it. That's, that's it, that's all you need to know. Secondly, however, for the purposes of this presentation, I wanna focus on the Jeremiah. The Jeremiah became a part of the American rhetorical tradition around the 17th century, the New England, around the New England Puritans, as a way to express their self-identity as, quote, chosen people, believing that they had a divine plan to free uh, corrupt European religious and social establishment. The Puritans, as many would call them later, felt a need to establish a, quote, holy society in the wilderness of America. Drawing from the biblical story of Exodus, the Puritans saw themselves as the new Israel, leaving the bondage of Europe to come into a new world they believe to be the promised land. They felt sure of themselves because in being the new Israel, the Puritans believed themselves to be the chosen ones whom God has called and ordained to be an instrument of God's will. With the chosen people leading the way, America became the proverbial city on the hill whose light shone for all of us to see. Hallelujah, glory to God. <laughs> but unlike prophetic rhetoric of the Jeremiah, the African-American prophetic tradition does not have its origins in freedom. Birth from slavery shaped in Jim and Jane Crow America. The African-American version of the prophetic tradition has been the primary vehicle that has comforted and given voice to many African-Americans. Through struggle and sacrifice, this tradition has expressed Black people's call for unity and cooperation, as well as the community's anger and frustrations. It has been both hopeful and pessimistic. It has celebrated the beauty and myth of American exceptionalism and its special place in the world, while at the same time damning it to hell for not living up to the promises and ideas of America. America espouses. It's a tradition that celebrates both the creator's or the divine's hand in history, offering hallelujahs for deliverance from slavery and Jim and Jane Crow, while at the same time asking where in the hell is God during the tough and trying times. It is a tradition that develops a theological outlook quite different at times from orthodoxy, one that finds God very close, but yet so damn far away. For many African Americans, the Jeremiah proposed that, that that was a huge problem anyway. Inherent in the Jeremiah is that its proponents never questioned the foundation 
of its belief or in prophetic terms, it never questioned the sacred. People primarily using their Jeremiah never questioned their belief that America was the promise, uh, America was the land of promise and destiny. They never questioned that belief that they were the new Israel or chosen people. Whenever calamity happened, the Puritans may have believed that it was because somebody sinned, but that sin was only a corrective to get us back in line. Nothing that's gonna take away our chosenness. Once the people start living up to what the people held as sacred, the calamity will cease, God will heal the land. However, for many African-Americans, African-Americans did not have confidence or think that the covenant would even work for them. If Americans, African-Americans adopted a prophetic persona to appeal to their audiences, they had to find other means. So in this presentation, I argue that A. Philip Randolph used prophetic rhetoric grounded in the African-American prophetic tradition to engage his audiences. I demonstrate this by highlighting only a piece, just the first part of that definition grounded in the sacred because he begins, especially during um, the 40s, 50s, and 60s, during the, quote, civil rights era, really begins to re-examine what it means when we talk about sacred and sacredness. And I just want to highlight, instead of going into all of the realms of the sacred, I just want to highlight the rhetoric around the personhood of Jesus. It's here that I argue that Randolph not only adopts this prophetic persona within the black rhetorical and prophetic tradition, not only to build a social movement, but to, but to do so, he draws heavily from his black church experience right here in Jacksonville. In his speech commemorating the Diamond Jubilee of the Bermuda African Methodist Episcopal uh, Conference, um, Randolph frames Jesus as the leader of a band of Christians in Judea in the first century to become the Messiah of mankind under the banner of the one and true living God. Randolph continued this framing of Jesus in the speech on March on Washington. He did give a speech that day too on August 28, 1963. He told the audience that day, and we have taken our struggle into the streets as the labor movement took its struggle into the streets. As Jesus Christ led the multitudes through the streets of Judea. The plain and simple fact is that until we went into the streets, the federal government was indifferent to our demands. It was not until the streets and jails of Birmingham were feel that Congress began to think about civil rights legislation. However, a fuller understanding of Randolph's Jesus would come in his address at Pilgrim Baptist Church. Randolph begins to, uh, his address by grounded in the sacred words of Jesus himself by speaking when he spoke to his disciples, I have compassion upon the multitude because they continue with me three days and have nothing to eat. I will not send them away fasting for they may fall by the wayside for divers may come from afar. Situating Jesus's words at the beginning of his speech or sermon helps him to frame the rest of this sermon. He wanted his audience to know that Jesus Christ in his earthly form, and that's gonna be important later, was concerned about the poor, the forgotten man, the worker, the disinherited, the propertyless, and the oppressed, unquote. Further quoting Jesus, he said, when the lowly Nazarene said, come unto me, all you who heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I am meek and lowly at heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And followed this declaration with the admonition to his disciples of Again, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go in the eye of the needle than a rich man to get into the kingdom of God. He expressed the central doctrine of what he was beginning to call a Christian revolution. It is here that his audience begins to see the prophetic unction of reshaping and refashioning the sacred Jesus from the embedded theological positions of his day. Randolph does two things here to reshape Jesus, and I'm through. First, by highlighting the personhood and humanness of Jesus, the lowly Nazarene, Randolph invites his audience to see Jesus on their level. 
What did Jesus do in the body while he walked on earth? This is different from the Jesus that is high and lifted up. The Jesus that most believers will see as the authentic Jesus. Randolph Jesus is personable and relatable. G Randolph Jesus has dusty feet and need water and need to go to the bathroom and gets hungry every now and then. And yes, even gets upset and frustrated. Somebody say, turn it over some tables. However, it's the second part of the opening that shifts his presentation by quoting Jesus words to his disciples and after telling about the parable of the young rich ruler who wanted to inherit eternal life Randolph sees Jesus and a uh, 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 Jesus uh, and, and as a revolutionary which for him when taken seriously leads to what he called the Christian revolution according to Randolph it was the first time since the days of old Hebrew prophets that a religious or government leader expressed the concept of egalitarian status of the ancient lowly and common laborers, the camel drivers, the publicans, the sinners, with the high priests of the scribes and Pharisees, Sadducees, conquering warriors, philosophers, and kings. This rhetorical move not only highlights the earthly Jesus, but also connects him with the 8th century BCE prophets in the Hebrew Bible. Randolph centers Jesus' prophetic rhetoric when he tells his audience or told his audience that Jesus made it unmistakably clear where he stood with the respect to the how of the haves and have nots. When he cried out, woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, you devour widow houses and, and for the pretense make long prayer, therefore you shall receive a greater damnation he continued and when Jesus came to his hometown where he was brought up he went into the synagogue delivered uh stood up and read and there he delivered unto him a book from the prophet Isaiah and when he opened the book he found in the pages the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised. Now, Randolph's construction of Jesus is complete. He, by highlighting Luke 4, 18 and 19, which many scholars call Jesus' manifesto, Randolph places Jesus with those who are on the margins of society, the people many would like to forget. And since for, Jesus, uh, for Randolph, this was the Christian revolution well nigh 2,000 years ago, this is the mission of the civil rights revolution today. Not only is the civil rights revolution through sit-in, wade-ins, lie-ins, lie-down, marches, boycotts, picket lines, shaking America, if not the world, into consciousness of Black America's will to win freedom, racial and social justice, and human dignity, but it is our awakening and arousing the white workers, white liberals, leaders of the Church of Protestant, Catholics, and Jewish faith, and the white poor to the magnitude and importance of the problem of poverty to Negroes and white Americans alike. In short, the gospel is being preached through the civil rights movement, he will argue. The gospel is manifested in the civil rights movement. In our forthcoming work with Amanda Neil Egger with the University of Press of Mississippi, and they are here, go see Emily um, down there, she, she's great. The summer of 2020, George Floyd and the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement. We interviewed several activists of the BLM movement. One of the areas we wanted to know was about the role of faith in the movement. One of our interview interviewees, we call her Bright Eyes, not her real name, saw her relationship with Jesus as foundational to a role in Black Lives Matter. I keep going back to Christ, she asserts. Then she continued, the church has to teach that if there is to be salvation for you, then your salvation is tied to how you embrace the stranger, how you embrace someone you think is the other. The church cannot be silent. The church has a role to play in where we're going in the future. We can't preach on Sunday and sit in our homes and do nothing Monday through Saturday. It can't be like that anymore because the black church has always been instrumental in the growth of the black society from the civil rights movement. But then she says, but they have lost their way. Bright Eyes participation in the black church and BLM highlighted something else for us as we discovered in our previous work while participants did not believe that the black church was in full participant in the BLM movement or not or not to that level that would have satisfied them many agreed that the faith they had learned in the church was one of the primary reasons of their involvement 
with BLM. It was in the church that had lost its way that some participants still found the way to join the movement and grounded it in their faith experience. Now, while scholars note that early in his messenger days, Randolph chastised churches and religious leaders, biographer Cornelius Bynum writes that, quote, the church and the liberation gospel that shaped its very founding helped to guide Randolph's subsequent ideas about social justice that blended egalitarian messages about racial self-worth and industrial reform and shaped core elements of his subsequent civil rights and labor activism. Just like Bright Eyes in our focus group on BLM, Randolph discerned enough from the church of his youth to appreciate what he could uh, what he could and critique what he should. He found that by adopting a prophetic persona to liberate Jesus from the embedded theological framework of his day, he could not only speak to be heard, but potentially move the crowd, but also in the process, finding the joy of his own salvation by speaking truth to power and letting the chips fall where they may. Thank you. You fine. And that's that's the reason I didn't want to go last. <laughs> I, I think uh, before we, is there a microphone for the question and answer? So people just have to talk loud. All right. So I I think uh, I think before we get to that point, I, I think I want to pose some I guess some questions to to my brothers here, and and I think I think the the biggest one I have a, I just have a couple because I want to I want to leave enough time for for audiences and I, and I really want Dr. Bynum to, to chime in here. Um, I, I think one of the questions is is uh, what is what does Randolph mean mean to you? because I, I think for for me, Randolph was one of the reasons I became a sigma. Um, my journey was 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 a was a long one but I, but I think in thinking about where I wanted to be, in a black Greek letter organization. I think the, the two people which really drove me to, to become a Sigma were, were Harold Washington and A. Philip Randolph. Wow. And, and I think and I think Randolph, I, I grew up I grew up in Cook County, Illinois, Cook County politics, Democratic politics. I mean, this, you know, you live in you live in a one party state on a, on a black person on the south side of Chicago is kind of like, you know, Harold Harold is Harold is like your guy. You know, as some you know, as some grandparents have a picture of Martin Luther King hanging in the in, in the living room. We had Harold Washington. You know, so knowing that Harold was made in, in my chapter was important to me. But I think, as a as a labor historian, I think one of the people who got me involved in thinking about what I wanted to do with my career for the past thirty years it was it was Randolph, because because Randolph had for me. Uh, this ability to to talk to a wide variety of people, as as Brother Johnson talk, you know, outlined is like the way he used and used words to appeal to the masses was <laughs> was, in, was important. And I and I think also as someone who studies the Black Freedom Movement, I I, I don't necessarily think that we will be in the position that we are in now as far as the study of black freedom and liberation without a Philip Randolph. Because, you know, E.D. Nixon talks about if there was you no know, A. Philip Randolph, there would be no E.D. Nixon because Nixon was a Pullman car porter. A, a Pullman car porter. And if there was no E.D. Nixon, we may not have a Martin Luther King because E.D. Nixon was the one who encouraged King to come, right, to uh, Montgomery for the Montgomery bus boycott. And I think in the larger conversation about A. Philip Randolph, these are some of the things that are missing. And I, I'm I'm so proud to be part of this of this panel because you know being in in um, Randolph's hometown, I think this was important to talk about, and I also think it's important to think about as we revisit the 60th anniversary of the 63 March on Washington, and as a member of the as a vice chair of the program committee. Uh, Sylvia Cyrus, the executive director, looked at us all and said, "You know, we have no conversations about the 63 March, and that's 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 
that's unacceptable. So I think my my brothers here, we were able to pivot a little bit to, to talk about some of these things. But so I, I posed a question to the panelists. I mean, what does what does Randolph mean? What is the legacy of Randolph? I can just say that um, as someone who does work in the public humanities domain and really tries to center his work around justice, um, it's been very influential. And also just kind of understanding that sometimes, and I know we, we're, we're kind of going back and forth between the idea of like him having more notoriety through the legacy work that he's done, especially as it pertains to the March on Washington. But I also understand that, that some, the work is done on the ground. And sometimes there's organizers who are just in the back and they're, and they're doing that work. He spoke, he was an organizer, but he didn't necessarily need that notoriety to fuel his activism. And to me, I'm, I'm very motivated by that. And I see him in the larger spectrum a great Sigma men who have done this type of activism from Randolph to Newton to Jose Williams to John Lewis. Yeah. I mean, all these great men have done that and they have all motivated me in the type of activism I seek to do within my profession, but for also for my community. Uh, it, also, it also kind of speaks to the idea of doing this activism sort of from a diasporic lens, right? because sometimes we treat black as a monolith. And as a black Puerto Rican, like I, I, I take issue with that. And uh, when I saw Sigma, I saw, I saw the Pan-Africanism in many men. And I saw the diaspora in many men and that drew me to them. And I think in taking a stance, I think it's a political stance just to even say that black is not a monolith. And for me, that's what drives me and, and one of the reasons why I connect to Randolph. <laughs> My father for about 15 years was a member of local 1199. My mother was a member of district council 37, local 372. <laughs> My mother was a member of District Council 37, Local 372. My father was a member of, local, of 1199. I was a member of the United Federation of Teachers when I was a public school teacher in New York City. I was a member of the SUNY faculty when I taught at SUNY. Um, I was born and raised in labor unions. Right. Began my first organizing, making phone call at the phone banks to get Jimmy Carter elected in 1976, I was 10 years old. Mm -hmm. um, a. Philip Randolph has always stood out for me well before I knew any connection to Phi Beta Sigma, well before I knew who the depth of who he was mm -hmm. because of his relationship with the orders. Right. Um, and that always resonated for me in very powerful ways. As a scholar teaching and writing in North Carolina, which is a state that is not hospitable right. to unions, Good way put. where I have sat in conversations with upper administration and no one in the room either belonged at any point in their career to labor unions or had family members that belonged to labor unions, right? And this is a campus now in which graduate students were just granted the right to organize two months ago. Mm. Um, in which contingent faculty were just allowed to organize three years ago. It's A. Philip Randolph that keeps me connected to these kinds of issues. Um, and as I said earlier, as I'm looking at the folks who came through Phi Beta Sigma, right, A. Philip Randolph is one of the reasons. There's also a photograph from that March on Washington of A. Philip Randolph sitting with James Baldwin and Baird Rustin. And who they were in the fullness of who Baldwin and Rustin were was not unknown. Exactly. And certainly not unknown to A. Philip Randolph. And while there were other figures in the movement who tr tried to provide a distance, particularly from Rustin, mm. from these men, 
A full of random saw past that, right? It was about reaching everybody who connected to the fullness of who we were at Black people, regardless of who you were and what other things that other folks might deem as problematic for your inclusion in the movement, A. Philip Randolph was not invested in that kind of divisive politics within the Black community. Wow. And of course, I knew of A. Philip Randolph. I teach the speeches and we do talk about them in classes and stuff. But it wasn't until I started to read the corpus of his work for this presentation. You know, when you said you're gonna do, I immediately just said, okay, I need, I just need to get a bunch of speeches. That's what I, that's my starting point. <laughs> Give me a bunch of speeches. Let me see what's going on. Then I found some biographies and, and let's talk about them. I really began to understand what it is that you're talking about, about, um, so this just makes, makes me think even more about finishing this up uh, as a publisher of a paper to answer, to try to offer a suggestive answer of why we do not know or we do not uh, look at him as. But I, can I just ask this question since we are in Jacksonville today and since right now you have many unions are striking. I wonder how unions feel about a Philip Randolph. <laughs> I'm like, I, 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 before I came over here, you know, I'm, I'm over in the double tree. So I was getting dressed and coming over, had uh, take some time to get over, but I was watching CNN and more um, of the big three, more of those factories folk walked out today because negotiations uh, broke down. And so, I knew we would be doing this today. I just wonder, do they know that rich history and understand, uh, uh, um, you know, how important A. Phil Randolph is and, and how, how does he then bring all of these different ideas, voices and people together and, and doing this work in the height of Jim and Jane Crow America? Absolutely. I wonder, I wonder, Dr. Bynum, can we get a mic to Dr. Dr. Bynum? Come on, Cornelius, you owe me. Come on. <laughs> it was my birthday oh. yesterday. You got it. All right. <laughs> Check one, two. Check. I, I actually have a question. I actually have a question if I, or do you want me to say something? <laughs> what, what, either way. Oh, yeah. well, my question is is for, for, uh, for uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Andre, I was, I, oh, oh, okay. Yeah. Tell the tell the story of uh, Randolph <laughs> and uh, and Henry McNeil Turner. You know, tell tell the story of what it means to be uh, a man of God, right, proselytizing right, right. the Jim Crow yeah. South or the the uh, the uh, post -re Reconstruction South. Re real quick, real quick, right? Uh, uh, a. Philip Randolph's father was a minister in the AME Church. He thought that Bishop Turner was just, I won't say he worshiped him, that's too strong, but he really thought that Bishop Turner was the real Bishop of the AMB church. Where Bishop used to come in this area, give a, he will open up his church and his home. Set him. And so young Asa grew up listening to Bishop Turner preach. And he tells the story of one, one of those meetings where Bishop Turner, because he's traveling in the South, right? He's going to these different churches. He's bishop now, but, you know, he's still traveling pretty much by himself. Did not have the armor bearers and the and the, all of the security that some of us have now, you know. But but he's traveling like that. And so he gets to the pulpit, and this is in Asa's mind. He, he Of all the things he remembers, he remembers this. Um, when he's about 10 years old. Well, how old? Seven, yeah. <laughs> you know the story, right? He go, he's going. <laughs> yeah, you know where you, you, you know where I got it from. But uh, he talks about, you know, putting Bishop comes to the pulpit, places two guns on the pulpit and just had to explain. This is what I have to do when I travel. I have to protect myself. And so 
the whole notion of so when Bishop Turner in 1897 um, gave a speech, Negroes get guns and pray to God, your aim is straight. That that that's 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 right. <laughs> that was not anything out of the ordinary. So, uh, uh, um, um, the Randolphs would have applauded that and more because the Randolphs they had guns. And you also talked about the time when uh, Mama Randolph had to sit on the porch at night with a shotgun in her lap because they were going out and protecting the community. So so he's growing up in in ways, and this is my own theological outlook on this, they're not starting anything, but he's growing up in ways in which the community demonstrated the love they had for each other by protection and by saying that you're just not going to come in here and just shoot and just go crazy without a proper and fitting response. And, and what I did was when I read that in your book, I started going back and I'm reading uh, Turner stuff and, and speeches and right around that same time. And I'm like, oh man, this, 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 this I got to, I got to work on this. This is something, it's going to be tight, man. It's going <laughs> thank you for your scholarship. Right. Okay. There you go. See, there. <laughs> I wonder if it's useful to, to have people, if you can stay in the middle, instead of running around, yeah, the usefulness of, of doing it that, that way. Thanks. Well, thanks to all of you and welcome to Jacksonville, the city where Mr. Randolph experienced the most formative years of his life and where we, in the 21st century, we continue to fail to do enough to acknowledge arguably the single most influential civil rights leader of uh, wow. 20th century mm -hmm. America. We have a park, we have a school, we have a street named for him. There is a waiting room name for him at the former Jacksonville Terminal Railroad Station, uh, but we need to do more. And so we're working on that. I think my question is principally for Professor Johnson. Congratulations again. Thank and uh, But it was Professor Neal who remarked about the transition from life in Jacksonville to New York as being a reinvention, right? Right. Of, on, on Mr. Randolph's part. Right, that was okay. <laughs> borrowed from Professor Bynum, but uttered by we all riffing, <laughs> uttered by Professor Neal. So, if we take that that transitional that period of reinvention to heart, and the chronology of it brings us to the 1919 critique of the Black mm -hmm. Church that Professor Johnson expressed. I'm thinking of Mr. And, and by the way, your insights into Mr. Randolph's spiritual journey are really a response to something that has intrigued me for a very, mm. very long time. How could a guy who grew up as the child of an AME minister have really um, shifted his focus uh, for the movement for justice to something that many biographers and scholars read as rigidly and inflexibly secular? Right. But you've Good elucidated uh, some of the complications on that, and thank you for that. But I'm thinking of Mr. Randolph as going through this period of reinvention and then I'm I'm thinking, too, that everything we know about the children of clergy and ministers of any religious uh, sect or denomination is that they grew up with a complicated set of baggage and a legacy of really sort of religious indoctrination and, and, and uh, education. And it's not surprising that many of them step back from that, in some cases right. outright brush it back and dismiss it and then go through decades sometimes of spiritual reinvention. Mm -hmm. It's hard to see into anybody's spiritual mm -hmm. life, right? But Professor Johnson, what would you say we can see right. credibly about Mr. J Mr. Uh, Randolph's sort of spiritual journey? It could not have all have been just about cynically exploiting the rhetoric of, of right. the movement no, no. of Christianity. No, no, uh, and and uh, and Dr. Bottom can um, jump in if he likes because the way that I am reading now, Randolph, every biographer or everyone who's written so far that I've read talks about his formative years, which you just mentioned um, here in Jacksonville, as good and help. He had a good experience, and it's not like 
something broke, quote unquote, broke him in the church and he breaks away or whatever. His issue comes when he gets up, you know, of course, the heart of him and he starts traveling and he looks, I'm saying, and this is just me glancing over the material that I've just uh, glanced over. I'm thinking that he is disappointed and what the church is, what the churches are doing, churches, by the way, that would have, would have had more wealth, more members, more connections than his church here in Jacksonville. And he's seeing what they were doing versus what they were doing. And he begins to offer this, what I would consider a prophetic critique. He doesn't get away. And so the work that I've been doing with BLM and talking about the spirituality of BLM, I'm trying to get folk to understand that there are people on the ground that you see maybe on TV or you see in these rallies and stuff, they are out there because their faith dictates that and is not traditionally orthodox in a way that we think it might be, but it is this mix of what scholars would call this liberal humanism and uh, orthodox theological outlook and whatever the case. What I try to demonstrate here is one of the ways that you can get to this position is by reconfiguring, restructuring, reimagining what actually the savior of your faith tradition looks like and acts like. And so he is talking most about earthly Jesus, Jesus on the ground, the Jesus that engaged with people and calling his audiences to do the same. And he had always been like, even when he was um, 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 at the height of the messenger and beginning um, um, the movement with the Pullman carporters, he was always trying to push churches to see Jesus in that area, never leaving it, but just trying to do it. He ends up later in life, in the, you know, doing the 50s, joining officially back up with the AME church and remain a member until his death, uh, as far as I know. So he was always there, but he, as a prophet, you have to call out the stuff that you feel called to call out and, and to highlight. And I think that's what he was doing early in his career. But I also think that there's something else in it. His, his activism kind of fits in the narrative of how black people, black political activists have always done, right? Yep. I, I think we have taken bits and pieces of different rhetorical and, and civil rights strategies, take the parts that we like and abandon everything else. I mean, that's, 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 that's essentially what, what Robin Kelly was, at, was arguing and, 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 and hammering and hoe, right? Take the parts that we like and throw everything else away. And let's not, let's not really forget that perhaps part of his turning away from the church may be part of his, you know, his alignment with the Socialist Party, right? And, and his, his distrust of large organizations. You know, um, one of the stories I forgot to tell you about, about his time in Chicago is when he ironically enough comes as, as someone who is disavowed religion, comes back to the church to organize the March on Washington movement and declares it an all black led movement. Right, so even, even with that, he goes to, the, to, the, to this space to talk about blackness and nationalism. I think, I, I think it's safe to say he's a, he was a nationalist, right? Because he, he, he worked for the advancement of the working class, but focused primarily on an organization that was, that was dedicated to fighting for and led by black people. And he, and he goes to the church to organize that. I don't think that should be lost in anybody as someone who's a, an atheist socialist for that part of his life, you know? So I, I think he's, he's just doing what most black activists were doing in, in, in remaining fluid in how they saw activism in their speeches and in contact with people in the community. Yeah. Go. I, want to, I want to commend you all on giving us more light into F, um, A. Philip Randolph. I have written a one act play on black history in the Newport News shipyard in Virginia. Mm. And that, it's the shipyard that builds nuclear carriers the best in the world. And what you have said about A. Philip Randolph, when I do a second draft of this play, I'm going to include some of your information in terms of black labor history in the Newport News shipyard. I have a question about him. I found, I found out more about um, Randolph in reading about Bayard Rustin. 
Rustin, biographies of Bayat Rustin. And my question is um, his socialism. Uh, he was a brave black man to be marginalized from the start and then to join the <laughs> Socialist Party. I saw that as being daring. We talked about 1940 something, 1930, Dr. Bynum. And so I wanted to hear, shed more light on his socialism. I know they kept an FBI file on him. And I wanted to hear more about the socialist aspect of him. And we all know that if you read Martin Luther King's last book, Where Do We Go From Here? KR is a community. The last book he wrote in 1967, he was leaning towards socialism. Well, my my grandma grew up a, a kid in uh, Depression Era Chicago. And she used to talk about when she was a kid, how the Reds would be down in Washington Park giving out food. And at the time, not really knowing what a red was, what they what she did understand that, is that they were trying to help black people. At the same time during the 1930s, there were these infamous uh, flying squads. So when the when the eviction riots of 1931, when black people were being put out of their homes uh, during the depression for the, for the inability to pay rent, where it would eventually make it down to Washington Park, and the reds would go and put the people back in their apartments and challenge and eventually challenge the Chicago Police Department to put the people back out. And after a while, CPD refused to do evictions because the communists were protecting the rights of these black residents. I, I don't find it. So I, I think part of the problem with our how we think about socialism and or communism is by looking at it through the lenses of the Cold War. And in the, I think in the hearts and minds of black people in the teens, 20s and 30s, and et cetera, I think it was, it's a very, communism and socialism meant something a little bit different because the communists and the socialists, they were the ones that were talking about uh, equality, equality, right? They were the ones who were out on the shop floor, out in CIO corner, out at River Rouge, out in the out in the the packing houses, in the steel mills, in the coal mines, and these were the ones. The communists were the one that were they were really good at organizing black people. So I, I I think when thinking about people like Randolph and Paul Roberson, you know, in in their in their their linkage to to the to, to the left, I think we really must think about those types of issues using the lenses of the 1920s and 30s, not the lenses of 1980s and 90s. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that unusual for Black people to align themselves with the Communist or Socialist Party, take what they want, say, yeah, we like the organizing, we like the ending race hatred, that's a good idea. Yeah, we like the idea of higher wages, it's a good idea. Uh -huh. Hey, hey you know, following the lead of Moscow, and eh, not so much. Mm. <laughs> right? We like this stuff, don't like this stuff. So they made their own form of like maybe Black socialism and Black communism. Right, and I think that's that's a that's a better way to think about his alignment with with the left and the far left. So. Um, hey, Jam. Can you all hear me? Uh -huh. Okay, I wasn't sure how you to make this work. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I want to uh, thank all the panelists for an outstanding presentation. I really feel like I learned a lot about A. Philip Randolph. Um, my name is Marla Puzis. I'm a volunteer at the Pathfinder Press booth. Um, we are located at booth number three on the third floor. And I want to, um, and we're very proud to feature at our booth a book entitled Fighting Racism in World War II which talks about A. Philip Randolph and the broader movement fighting against Jim Crow segregation in the army, in the war industries, the March on Washington, and also more broadly against racist violence and lynching um, under the Jim Crow system. Um, and so I want to invite you, all of you, um, audience and panelists, to stop by our booth, check out this book and others that we offer on the historic struggles for black rights. I also have a question for you. Um, if you could elaborate a little bit more on the union organizing efforts at the March on Washington, and also in learning more about the Emmett Till murder 
and the heroic efforts of his mother to publicize what had happened to him in order to educate and stimulate a movement in response to the racist violence. Um, I know of the role of the Pullman Porters in helping uh, disseminate information and helping um, Mamie Till Mobley to uh, retrieve her son's body from Mississippi and so forth. But I wonder if you could elaborate any more, was there a role specifically of A. Philip Randolph in that or a more broadly explain the role of the, the Pullman Porters and the union movement in, in that effort, which really kind of launched or gave rise to the Montgomery bus boycott, um, inspired it and helped to inspire the, the rise of the civil rights movement in the late 50s and 60s. Thank you. Is that for me? <laughs> okay. I, I missed the first part of the question, but I I I, I think I see where you're we're going. I think what you're asking about the role of the porters with the, the beginning of the, the, the burgeoning civil rights movement and, and Emmett Till in particular. All right. So I, I think the the common story is and, and again I I try to frame frame my work in Chicago. So one of so I think by and large owning, possessing, reading or otherwise having a copy of the Chicago Defender was illegal in many places in the South, right? So, it, and it, it wasn't uncommon for Pullman porters to smuggle copies of the Pittsburgh Courier, the Chicago Defender and other black weeklies to the, to the South to be disseminated and read and, and essentially smuggle them in, into, into the deep South. And I, I don't think we should really underestimate just how important that was for the, when this, how this information were able to get from places of relative freedom down to places where black people were, black bodies were overly policed, nobody surveilled, and the opportunities for African Americans were extremely limited. Now, to go back to um, uh, Emmett Emmett Till and, and the murder of Emmett Till, I'm not too sure about that. Uh, as far as the, the the Porter's role in 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 that particular thing, but I think in the in the the larger arena of the Black Freedom Movement, um, educating and providing this information from places like Chicago to places in the South, I, I, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't be uh, surprised uh, to say that this helped galvanize this this spirit in the Deep South. I think one of the things that that occurs is that uh, Robert Abbott and, and other folks provided, you know, um, painted a picture of places like Chicago and and, and Detroit and New York. It painted a picture of of this promised land for for Southern blacks to come up. So, I mean, I'm I'm not sure about the the the, the Emmett Till angle, but I think as as stimulating and sparking a civil rights movement, I think the Pullman Porters and what they what they were able to do with the with the newspapers and jobs and other things, I think we we shouldn't underestimate that. And we I, I think those who teach the movement talk about the Porters, but I think in the larger Larger narrative, we, they don't get enough credit for what they what they've done. And I'm sorry, I missed the first part because I couldn't over the music. So, all right, good evening, brothers. Good evening. Um, good evening. Again, thank you for you know giving us more insight on A. Philip Randolph and you know the presentation as a whole. I'm Brother Sankofa with Florida Reparations Compliance Committee. We um, take on the job of floor, of rep, of advocacy, excuse me, for reparations within the state of Florida, and um, with Brother A. Philip Randolph being such a prominent figure in civil rights, particularly around economic justice and fighting racism in labor and industry. Uh, he also went so far as to propose a freedom budget, something like a, mm -hmm. yeah, like a universal basic income. I wanted to know if you all could give more insight or maybe that brother back, back there may know of any materials or writings that could give us like some type of idea of what his stance would have been on reparations is my personal opinion that I think he would have been pro reparations. Also, I would like to know what what do we have to do to get, namely Phi Beta Sigma, as well as other divine nine organizations to be more vocal and to take on a more prominent role in advocating for reparations to black Americans, direct cash payments that is. That's right. All right. You, uh, uh, well, let me start with, <laughs> You probably have more of a chance to talk to us four particular brothers of five minutes <laughs> <laughs> about that reparations piece than than the national organization. 
Um, but I think, you know, in, in the case of A. Philip Randolph, I think you're right. You know, the stuff that he was able to negotiate on behalf of the Pullman porters, um, particularly in terms of back wages and things like that, it, it's a form of limited reparations. Uh-huh. I have no doubt, particularly in the context of the kind of lay, lay, uh, wage theft yes. that has occurred for Black workers over the last century, that he would have definitely been on board a conversation around reparations. One, one, quick, one quick editorial note. I got word from the vice president of the program. The live stream is going to cut off at 6 o'clock. Right. So I think that uh, before that time, I want to thank everyone and thank the panelists for coming out so that we can end the video appropriately. Um, uh, so thank you to my brothers and thank you all for the for the great questions. I don't want to cut the questions off quite yet. So we have six minutes, but just for the purposes of, of the live stream, I just make sure that we end on a, on a good question. So we do edit. So we end the question. So uh, we have six or seven minutes left. So let's try to get through as many questions yeah. as we can. Uh, just before we do that, I wanted to make a one quick announcement at 615 in the Clearwater room on the third floor of the building, we're going to do, uh, there will be a, a Sala member remembrance ceremony for all of the, the, the members who have recently passed away. So uh, we will invite people to, to, to go to that session as well. So uh, with that being said, let's go back to the questions. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, thank you all for, so loud. thank you all for putting on this event. When we talk about Philip A. Randolph, from my understanding, um, the brother was regarded as the dean of Negro leaders. And in my humble assessment, if he was the dean, then Martin Luther King Jr. would have been the valedictorian. <laughs> and so I bring up Dr. King because when I think of when we were at our best as a people, it was when we were being led by Black men and women who were totally convicted in a higher power, be it Nat Turner, Elijah Muhammad or Fannie Lou Hamer. But today, an institution that was once a powerhouse for us, I respectfully submit has become a political and economic slaughterhouse against us. So my question would be, how can we return the world of, back, of black religion to the luster of the days of Dr. King and Malcolm X? Right. 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 <laughs> returning it back to the luster i mean for me it's really just continuing to have these conversations and organizing right because again that's what i like about the quote that was put on the bottom of that that, that statue that monument was that it's about organizing and when i when i hear that it implies not just activism but intentional solidarity which means we have to get out of our own way to do this work. We get egos, we get big headed, we get a lot of things that really get in the way. And I think in order for us to really go into it with a socialist lean, we have to do it in solidarity. And for that, it has to take, we, we really need leaders that are empathetic and humble. And that's very difficult because even the folks that are fighting the good fight and they're doing grassroots movements sometimes adopt the same leadership styles that they rebuke. Mm -hmm. And until we have a really, well, since Dr. Johnson put it out there, come to Jesus moment mm -hmm. about these types of um, these types of barriers, I think we might have this conversation again in ten years. I would I would love to avoid that. But we have to be able to deal with this. I mean, again, what you know, what, what brother brother Neil said about uh, Asa Phil Randolph being able to acknowledge Baird Rustin and James Baldwin in that way—that that's no small thing, especially in those days, right? Right. So we, but we have to, but we have to build upon that. We can't just, oh, well, he did that, and that's all good. Like we had to build upon that. That takes conversation, that takes humility, and that takes intention from a collective, not from just one person. And real quick, I just want to add to that, that also, I will just say some of that is already happening today, but just like in 63, as it is in 2023, the, the, the religion that you're talking about, the, the, the liberative, empowering type of religion is always going to be rebuked and pushed back on. So it looks like because quite frankly, it's, it is. Most folk are doing something totally different. 
it's only the faithful few that's doing this work. You bring up King. King, when he died, was was what twenty nine percent approval. Everybody, everybody hated King. They, they hated. They thought what he was going too fast. You know? But now, fifty years later, we can look back. Same thing is happening right now. A lot of people are on the ground doing good justice work, doing 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 what I would call consider holy work. However, the most of the folk that you know are not looking at that or not you know seeing that as being important i just think we need to also open our eyes and know where to look if we're looking for these systems these holistic uh, um, uh, institutions that are doing the work so that we may join them and then do the work as well too i, I just want to add real quickly and, and and brother dr johnson can jump in on this I think we also have to be careful not to romanticize okay. people before because that 1960 National Baptist Convention yep. is like some real housewives of Atlanta shit. <laughs> right. You know, with, with really that we have grown, <laughs> exactly <laughs> with people that we've grown to respect and think highly of, right? You know, they that was some mess, you know, back and it was all about ego and sense of masculinity and the direction of the movement and all those kinds of things, right? So you will find wonderful examples, but also problematic examples that make us look at this moment, I think, in a, a better light. <laughs> right. Good. good question. Love it. Good, good, good question, though. Yeah. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jasmine Turner. I am a former National Park Ranger who uh, did work at the Robert E. Lee Memorial. Uh, called Arlington House and was working there when Charlottesville happened, just wow. for the context for my question. <laughs> I am also a native to Jacksonville, Florida. So I wanted to revisit some of the early discussion about how local people in Jacksonville view A. Philip Randolph, and also the discussion about Confederate memorials and monuments. This is a two-parter. For the most part, Jacksonville is very scared to even use the term socialist when explaining his philosophy, especially in our museums and in some of our historical societies. How do you, as a public historian, navigate a more accurate accounting for his philosophy when people are even scared to talk about socialism in the first place? Wow. That's good. Doc. That's great. That's another plenary. <laughs> it is. It is. I mean, I think, you know, in the work that, that, that I've been embarking on the last 12, 15 years, a lot of it is really framing situations to allow people to engage and challenge their own assumptions, creating, you know, thought-provoking questions in a way that allows people to, to really think before they regurgitate and retweet foolishness, right? And, um, and I think what we've been able to do in public history better is to be able to align historical evidences and use them as Socratic pieces to be able to evoke this type of powerful conversation. And I think as, if we can continue to create those spaces to do that, um, we'll be able to, to, to gain some, but for sure we're gonna lose some, for sure. Because as our good brother,